Are you a healthcare professional looking for a trusted concussion resource? Then you've come to the right place. From her New York City studios, welcome to Concussion Corner with your host, Dr. Jessica Schwartz. And now, a word from our sponsor. Did you know that sport helmets are rated on a five-star system similar to cars? And the safest helmets have nothing to do with price, brand, or availability? Since 2011, Virginia Tech researchers have been providing unbiased helmet ratings that allow consumers to make informed decisions when purchasing helmets. The helmet ratings are the culmination of over a decade of research identifying which helmets best reduce concussion risk. This work is done as part of Virginia Tech's service mission and is 100% independent of any funding or influence from helmet manufacturers. Our mission at Concussion Corner is to expose you, the listener, to trusted spaces in the concussion arena that translate to clinic next day. Please visit the Virginia Tech Helmet Lab website in our show notes or at bit.ly slash Virginia Tech Helmets and spread the word to aid in lowering concussion risk in your community. Thank you for tuning in and let's begin the show. Welcome to season four of Concussion Corner. My name is Dr. Jessica Schwartz, and I'm thrilled to have Dr. Becky Bliss with us today. Dr. Bliss is a clinical assistant teaching professor in the Doctor of Physical Therapy program at the University of Missouri and is board certified in neurologic physical therapy. She holds her certificate in vestibular rehabilitation from the American Physical Therapy Association, as well as an advanced vestibular certificate and is an, and is an impact trained physical therapist. Dr. Bliss graduated from Ithaca College Department of Physical Therapy with a combined undergraduate and graduate Master of Physical Therapy in 2001. She completed her doctorate in physical therapy from Des Moines University in 2014 and her doctorate of health science from the University of Indianapolis in 2019. Dr. Bliss has been actively practicing in the field of physical therapy for 19 years with specialization in concussion management since 2006. Her research interests include dysfunction of the vestibular ocular reflex following mild traumatic brain injury, as well as early detection of impairments that lead to post-concussion syndrome, and currently has several active studies specific to higher level motor control deficit identification in the sport athlete. Dr. Bliss is active with the Academy of Neurological Physical Therapy and is currently involved in the knowledge translation project related to evidence-based practice at MU Health. Becky, welcome to the Concussion Corner podcast. Thanks, Jeff, for having me. Uh, It's such a pleasure, and uh, it's always nice to have a fellow bomber, Ithaca Bomber, on the podcast. And, uh, you know, I still can't believe we actually have not met in person, you know, with all of our similarities and uh, trajectories here. I know it's kind of funny that uh, we've known each other, but haven't actually face-to-face had a meeting, but hopefully one day soon, maybe post-COVID. <laughs> I know, I know. I've, I do get my second vaccine uh, in a, a couple of weeks, so I'm looking forward to uh, being fully vaccinated, hopefully before these boosters start coming out. <laughs> yep. So, um, all right. So, you know, it's your first time on uh, the podcast. I'm so happy to have you on. Uh, our listeners are really going to just be, I think, so engaged with you uh, and learn so much from you. Um, you know, every first podcast that I have somebody on, it's really important for me to have the audience kind of get to know you uh, a little bit of your trajectory of how you became a physical therapist and got involved in concussion. Um, and we'll kind of just take it from there and, and kind of let you take the wheel and uh, introduce yourself. Sure. Um, so like you said, I've been practicing almost 20 years. It's hard to believe that that has, um, has occurred. I don't know where the time actually went. Um, early graduation from Ithaca, um, lots of student loans. So I landed myself down in Fayetteville, North Carolina, which um, if those of you who know, is the home of Fort Bragg, um, military base, so big army. And I met my husband on my interview day. So um, kind of funny, we joke that he's my sign on bonus um, for (laughs) that job. So I took my first job totally away from home, black sheep of the family, went down to Fayetteville, North Carolina, And I had the greatest opportunity to be able to rotate as a new grad every six months to different areas across the healthcare system. Um, So you name it, I've done inpatient rehab, um, both ortho neuro, I've done acute care, neurosurgical ICU, cardiac surgical ICU, wound care, and then landed in outpatient neuro after about five years of clinical practice. And that time it was right in that 2005, 2006 timeframe 
where all of our blast injury soldiers were returning from war over in Iraq and Afghanistan. And Fort Bragg was known for their orthopedic surgeries, you know, it's airborne, lots of broke, you know, back injuries, fractured ankles, those types of things. But as they were getting this signature injury of war with all of the soldiers coming home, they did not have at that time, they do now, but at that time they did not have a comprehensive um, traumatic brain injury program. But at our local county hospital, which is where I worked, we actually had an outpatient neuro clinic that had PT, OT, speech and neuropsych. So the army reached out and asked if we would be able to start seeing all of their soldiers until they could get something up and going um, that had to happen pretty quick. So I went from, you know, treating just general neuro population in an outpatient setting to the next week after we signed the contract to 13 new blast injury concussion patients. Wow. Um, so it was pretty wild. Um, it like I had to grab hold and just, you know, immerse myself in knowledge. I bought the Stu Herdman vestibular rehab book at that time. Um, and then really just death by fire. Um, and I think back and I'm just like, oh my goodness, like I didn't really know what I was doing, but it was somewhat okay because we're still actually doing some of that stuff now. And I really think it's kind of interesting that at that time in 2006, we had a multidisciplinary clinic with everybody at the same seat at the same table. Um, and here now in 2021, we're still struggling to get that multidisciplinary approach, um, which is the current recommendation for best practice when you've got the complicated post-concussive patient. Um, and so that's kind of where it was. I really learned that I needed to learn more about vestibular. And so I um, took this, the APTA certificate in vestibular rehab, um, and then just really tried to get as much. I did the Defense and Veterans Brain Injury Association conferences each year to learn more about specific military blast injuries. They're usually sponsored out of Tampa, Florida, and that was a wealth of knowledge as well to talk to other practitioners for mentoring of who were seeing blast injury. Um, and and the Karen, Karen Scott's down there too. And she's a friend. Of yeah, the Karen's well. down there, which is great. Yeah, Karen and I are good friends. Um, we have lots in common um, <laughs> from that aspect with the military side of things. Um, and so, you know, Bill was stationed. So, you know, married my husband, all that good stuff. Um, but then Bill was stationed at Fort Bragg on and off. So we did a stint in Germany, came back and then New York and then came back to Bragg for 10 years before his last duty station was out in Kansas City. So we moved family out to Kansas City and it was just a nice little translate like transition into the sports arena. So I met a retired NFL um, concussion emergency medicine sports medicine physician who is absolutely fabulous. So Dr. Joseph Wackerly and then really got involved in the Missouri Brain Injury Association, started doing some teaching, transitioned from clinical practice over to um, full-time academics, but I still spend time in the clinic. Like today was an eight hour day seeing post-concussive, like you name it, um, those types of things in the clinic today. So I kind of split my time as far as that goes just to stay in it, but I also have a great referral source um, here at the university. So I see a lot of the, the athletes here too, as well. That's awesome. And we appreciate you coming on after an eight hour day, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy. Yeah. I, I totally hear you on that. I used to work a, a three, three day work uh, week before my injury. Uh, and that was like a 13 and a third hour day. And I just don't know how I did that. So my husband's like, here, you need to eat before you talk. And I was like, yes, I need to eat. So <laughs> that's awesome. Um, yeah. You brought up a couple interesting things uh, that I definitely want to bring up because um, one, especially for the new grads that are listening, and this isn't PT or OT or, you know, any uh, rehab professional or physician that's listening in, I think it's so great that as a new grad, you actually got to uh, rotate every six months uh, in the hospital. And, you know, I don't know about you, you're in education, but I know when I was in clinic and, you know, I had our, our students, everyone wants to go into like the cool stuff, right? Sports or peds. Uh, they want to see little kids, uh, uh, orthopedics, you know, what have you. Um, but I think it's so valuable as a new grad to kind of rotate every six months so you can kind of get your feet wet. Um, what was your experience, you know, with that? Um, if you can just kind of give, you know, a little, a little like pep talk to a new grad that'd be out there today. Yeah. And I think you hit right on the spot about, you know, there's that residency, post-professional residency, you know, maybe I have to specialize so early. And I actually, my recommendation, I'm actually the program coordinator for our new neurological residency here at MU Healthcare. And my advice is don't specialize too early. I think my experience is being able to rotate every six months and you name it, I've seen it, right? So it really, 
makes me understand at a deeper level what is going on from a full body system side of things, right? Like if it wasn't for my cardiac surgical ICU um, rotations and, and different things like that, I may not have understood the autonomic nervous system dysfunction post-concussion as well as I do. Um, and so it's every little bit of those pearls that I think really make you a well-rounded therapist. Um, you know, medications, other conditions, comorbidities. I just saw, you know, I, my day was full of sport young as well as geriatric concussion today. So, you know, some of the endocrine dysfunction, those types of things that can contribute to some of the post concussional concussion symptoms, you know, that might be causing a little bit of delay in those types of things. And so, no, I actually recommend like, go just get your feet wet, go be a good generalist <laughs> um, before you specialize. Because once you specialize, I think you sometimes, I hear it all the time, you know, well, I've just been doing this for so long. I've been in inpatient rehab for 10 years. I can't ever do anything else. Well, no, yes, you can, right? Mm -hmm. um, from that aspect. So for me, it like if it wasn't for Cape Fear Valley Medical Center in Fayetteville, North Carolina, um, I would not be the therapist I am today. That's awesome. Yeah, and I think we can just learn so much from from your experience um, from there. So that's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, okay, so looking into uh, wow, so 2005, 2006. I mean, you were literally in the heart of it, you know, as we were in, with the, talking about the signature uh, injury of war in that 2008 time frame. Um, you know, what in terms of what did you, what were you doing then that was new and uh, innovative to you at the time, and what are you, and what are you still doing um, to this day that you know has carryover? Right. Um, so back then, um, with the blast injury, like post TBI, a lot of it was, oh, it's, you know, a vestibular injury, or they've got a ton of dizziness. Um, so I've always done more of the vestibular ocular rehab side of things. And then trying to really like these are tactical athletes. So it's on me to make sure they're fully ready to return to duty if that's where they're going to get um, to pass neuropsych and to return to duty, um, all of those things. So really trying to creatively. Thankfully, I had married a military guy, so I knew what the MOS was. Um, so it's basically what their, their job is um, in the military. So depending, you know, are they infantry? Are they out in the front lines? Are they a pilot? Do they need to ride an aircraft? Um, you know, are they a EOD? Um, so basically, they blow things up, you know, from all of that, you really need to understand. And at, at Fort Bragg, there was a ton of special ops and special forces. Um, and I have to say that they were probably one of the smartest patient populations. You would give them a task to do. They would figure out from a like motor planning, neuroplasticity side of like, you know, you're trying to give them dual tasks, VOR stuff at the same time while standing on a balance board. And they'll figure out how to do it and figure out how to do it 10 times better than what you even thought that they could do. And then be like, okay, so I'm good, right? And I'm like, oh, no, oh. you are not good. But because they were so smart, I was always on my toes. And I think it was that that totally makes me think from even on a sport-related side of things, what do they actually have to be able to do? And that's where, you know, some of my research interests has come in because a lot of the tests that we currently have for objective measures are very static or they're single task constructs. There's not a lot of, you know, dual tasking, functional measures specific to what that person has to be able to return to do. So we're using some measures that may not get at that higher level neuromotor control that that patient needs to be able to do. So I feel thankful to have to think outside the box way back when, you know, we've had simulated weapons. And I know this sounds crazy, right? In an outpatient clinic now, especially with, you know, weapons and guns and all this other stuff, but we would do simulated like Nerf guns. Um, that the soldiers would have to hold and actually like do quick turns and have to shoot at a target, right? To see, are they accurate? Is their vision working? Was their postural control off, you know, just a little bit that would actually make them miss their target. Yeah, or and even so, just from a monocular, binocular, you know, standpoint. Exactly, are they, you know, yes, absolutely. yes. Um, so those are some of the pearls that I think I've carried over, but we like back then, nobody knew anything about exertion, right? Uh -huh, I remember- right. And I love Richard Clendaniel. He is actually one of my mentors, like every time we see each other at CSM. But I remember at the time when I was seeing all the post-concussive patients and there wasn't a lot of literature specific to rehab, right? Um, for these patients. And I was like, hey, I took one of his courses and I was like, hey, you know, I'm getting them on the treadmill, like walking at the same time and doing some head turns just to get everything moving. 
do you think that's, you know, efficacy? What do you think about that? And he's like, I don't know why you're having to walk on the treadmill. They just need to do VORs. And now, you know, that was back in 2006. Um, and so, you know, obviously we've come a long way, but there wasn't the research specific to exertional rehab um, from that aspect of things. So, you know, we've come, I feel like the pendulum has swung both directions, right? Full rest cocoon therapy to the other side. Now we need to get a move early, but that hasn't trickled down into, you know, all of clinical practice yet, but hopefully right. it will. <laughs> yeah, move early. And, and again, kind of like for the listeners that are out there, you know, um, move early, but it's kind of like a Goldilocks situation that we can do harm if we move them too hard. Um, and that's Correct. why I always stress that, hey, we have to make sure that this is prescribed and people look at you like prescribing exercise. And yes, right. I have an exercise science major from Ithaca College, and that's what my whole degree was in before my doctorate. But the whole thing of the whole notion of prescribing exercise um, to a lot of folks is really foreign. Um, but it all comes down to dosing, intensity, frequency, um, and understanding what flare-ups are and that we're not, um, for the most part, there, we're not, um, let me just say, we're, there's a do no harm um, aspect to exercise and movement, but there can be a do harm if you actually push too hard from a lot of the models we've seen from Chris Giza and Holda and, and a few others out there. Correct. But, um, Correct. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. And, you know, I think from a physio standpoint, I mean, I get to like geek out with you a little bit here, Becky, but you know, we're coming up on our hundredth anniversary of being physical therapists uh, from the American Physical Therapy Association. And I have to remind people that, hey, we started literally in the trenches, not too far from a pandemic a um, hundred years ago, um, treating brain injury. Like literally that's what was happening. There were blast injuries, you know, after World War One, we were rehabilitation aides back then um, before we were physios. And that's kind of where we started. So it's so full circle, literally, you're, we're talking about, you know, your, you know, almost 20 year career from 2006, um, dealing with the signature injury of war, um, then to literally full circle, you know, we've been literally treating traumatic brain injuries since day one as physios. Um, but again, we've learned so much. And, and quite frankly, yeah, you were having that exert, you were picking up because you were a great clinician um, without realizing it back then, you know, of exertion, having them dual task and, you know, um, put, like really putting all the systems out to work uh, appropriately. So, um, and that was 2006, but we're still having this conversation in 2021 where a lot of folks just think they have to rest and cocoon and then get them back. So I'm so glad that you're like bringing this to light and people can really hear an expert, you know, in your day-to-day, -day, you know, practice and, and thought processes. Yeah, I just had it today actually in clinical practice, young girl, mid twenties, um, who had gone to her GP and let him know about everything. And he's like, you have to stop everything. You can't do anything. And she's six weeks post injury. So she comes to me and she's like, am I allowed to like, and I said, Hey, what have you been doing? Like, what do you like to do? Do you go to the gym? And we had to have a conversation and I was like, you know what, let's get you on the treadmill. Let's do that Buffalo concussion treadmill test. Mm -hmm. Let's look at your, you know, threshold if there is one let's you know and then let's actually get you moving because we know that active rehab is better than doing nothing at all so but dose to guided right um graded exercise like of like through a medical provider to help with that and so you know i just had this conversation today and we are in 2021 <laughs> No. Indeed. And, you know, I just want to also, because you're expert here, I, I want the listeners to really tie in because if you don't really work with the tactical athlete, it's actually something quite interesting. Um, you know, I always just say, hey, think back to the Olympics. Oh, may they rest in peace from 2020. I really hope we get something uh, for 2021 because these guys literally trained their, their whole lives to kind of uh, to kind of get there uh, for Tokyo 2021, hopefully this year. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, just think back to Michael Phelps. If you're watching Michael Phelps, you're literally, you know, there's a, a, a gold, a silver, and a bronze, and then the poor fourth place person. <laughs> but, you know, um, from a psychological standpoint, it's actually interesting that the, the silver folks have a tougher time than the bronze, And but I won't go into that whole psychological construct there. But if you're looking at that, if you're just thinking in your mind's eye back, in, back to four or five years ago from the last Olympics, you know, these are hundredths of a second, tenths of a second between first, second, third, and fourth place. Um, and that those are our athletes. Those are our elite level you know, swimmers and whatever is in the Olympics. Thinking back to the tactical athlete, these are athletes who are also then making life and death decisions who have to perform right. at such an elite level. Um, again, in certain positions like, you know, uh, if they're Air Force or, or jumping out of planes and, you know, having to deal with all that velocity and vestibular craziness, um, I would love for you to comment, you know, and especially for folks that have listened in before, we've had Brian Hainline on and a few other folks from the CARE Consortium, but that's why the CARE Consortium, the Department of Defense and the NCAA combined because tactical athletes are athletes at the end of the 
the day. So I would just love for you to comment on, you know, why it's so important um, to really push these folks, you know, outside of the box. It's like the ballerina with like 180 degrees of, you know, hip flexion or whatever it is. Um, mm-hmm. I, I would love for you to, to just comment on why, you know, putting our kick gloves on for these servicemen and women are so important, um, especially when dealing with head injury. Oh, absolutely. Um, one, they're going to, you know, you've got the ones that are like, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm good. Just get me back, get me back. And it's our job to figure out where are those underlying deficits still there? They're saying that, but are they truly ready, right? From that aspect of things. And then like, it's a lot of weight on your shoulders to make sure that they can do everything they need to be able to do. And I think this is, you know, in the sport athlete of things, like if there's a, I had a lacrosse player that I saw and I'm not like lacrosse wasn't big for me growing up in like rural New York. Um, there was no lacrosse teams. There's no lacrosse teams here in the Midwest when I saw them. So I didn't know a lot about it. So I took time to say, okay, explain to me, right? Like your position, what do you have to do? Tell me everything that you need to do functionally. And I used to have to do that. So some of, you know, some of the MOSs, I was like, okay, so what does that mean? Right. You know, do they, are you rip like zip lining down from, a tethered helicopter, right? That is actually moving in the air. They're trying to hold it stable. You've got wind and other elements that you're flying down this rope to land to then, you know, go out into the mountaintops where you're like sideways sideways on an incline and you're using completely nothing but ankle strategies and then having to right your body on top of your sideways ankles on the side of a hill, right? So no it's got no big deal, right? And that's where um, I had spoke a lot for USASOC, which is also down in Florida um, early on because it was like, oh, she knows what she's doing. She's been, you know, she's vestibular um, therapist. And so I gave a lot of conferences, but I actually had the amazing opportunity to go to San Antonio and tour the center of the Intrepid. And they were one of the first Perfect. locations that actually had the Karen system. Um, which now more of the locations have Karen. Um, it's very expensive, <laughs> 1 million plus, but it is the cave virtual reality, right? With the split belt treadmill um, that the person can be harnessed in and they would simulate with virtual reality. And this is way back like 2010, right? Um, that we were doing this. And then they could take the treadmill and it, tip it sideways to mirror the like on the incline of the side of a mountain and then put a gun in their hand and see you know can they hit the targets like how is the reaction time all of those different things and so you know just making sure that we can replicate and look at the quad and it's not even triple tasking right it's quadruple tasking if you think (laughs) about everything that actually has to happen and then what systems are working and have you checked to make sure um, Laura Morris and Rob Landell gave a great presentation at CSM several years ago. And I actually think it was, I'm trying to remember if it was in San Antonio. I think it might've been um, where they talked about it's the neck. No, it's the brain, right? And they gave this amazing like neuro ortho perspective of like watching this concussed injury of, a, of Olympic volleyball player that happened down in Rio that Rob actually looked at. And then, you know, Laura's perspective was all I see is a brain injury. This is all neuro. And Rob is like, all I saw was the neck, right? Like how does this all integrate together and making sure that you've got the eyes, the ears, the neck, all talking to each other is all the sensory systems telling you that everything is exactly a hundred percent, or is there a mismatch that then puts them at an increased risk of re-injury? Awesome. Yeah, I think I got to see something similar uh, as, is it called the Karen, the cave? Yeah, it's the cave. Yeah. Okay. Because I know uh, Karen has a whole different meaning today in 2021. Oh my gosh. Uh, I had to have my 12 year old explain it to me. So. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, my, my mom uh, called me the other day from Florida and had a, a question. I was like, oh, gosh, I was like, no, I can't answer that. You have to ask somebody else. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> um, but yeah, so yeah, I remember I was, uh, I, I had the good fortune to stay with Sue Whitney. I, I actually won some uh, lottery at the, oh, gosh, I think it was Indianapolis. So I think it was 2015 CSM. Uh, for those that I don't know, that's our combined section meeting uh, for American Physical Therapy Association, up to like 20,000 PTs uh, internationally come, you know, pre-COVID from all over the world. It's, it's a wonderful uh, time to be with your community and your people and to really collaborate and do work anyway. So I got to actually go uh, shadow uh, Sue, Dr. Whitney uh, at Pitt. Uh, and I actually saw this and it was fascinating because they're like throwing things on the treadmill, having folks negotiate. I mean, it was really quite uh, something to see. So um, definitely awesome that you had that experience out in San Antonio. 
Yeah, absolutely. It was definitely like, it makes you think outside the box. Yeah, I don't need a million dollars, right? To have this mm -hmm. piece of equipment. How can I recreate this in the clinic with my, you know, <laughs> 50 cent, you know, little things that I throw at my patients or how do I disrupt them? How do I put them on inclines, use multiple ways? You know what I mean? So you just have to think outside the box of, you know, when I do teach my courses specific to concussion, I will be like, let me show you the 50 cents version of a Dynavision that is normally $20,000, <laughs> right? Um, and I'm sure Dynavision's like, stop showing them this, right? Um, from that aspect, <laughs> but capital budget, you know, how do you afford all of this fancy equipment unless you've, you know, got donors and foundations and stuff like that? Indeed. And we'll talk about that in a little bit, probably for part two of our podcast. Um, you know, and I'm thinking just because we're on the CSM, you know, topic, and um, I know you just presented um, February 16th, you had your live Q&A, and I know it was a big hit. You had uh, like 12 questions in 30 minutes, and um, it was rapid fire. <laughs> um, you know, while we're here, we have a little less than 10 minutes left on this first podcast. I would love for you to like, let the people know what you presented on at CSM. Um, for those that don't know, CSM this year has been virtual, um, and you can still sign up um, and have access to you know, lectures and Q&A um, after the fact, which is wonderful from a space repetition and, um, you know, knowledge translation standpoint um, for folks that want to, you know, check out the APTA website. Um, I would love if you can let folks know what you presented on and kind of what the hot topic was. I mean, you were definitely a, a buzz, a buzzworthy um, presentation. Um, yeah, so a colleague of mine, um, we've been treating, so we run out of the University of Missouri as part of the curriculum, we actually run a pro bono clinic, it's the largest um, outpatient PT clinic, um, as far as pro bono goes associated with a program, a DPT program, and so I've been working alongside of him for about a year, and he is very well schooled in pain science and his background is chronic pain and the way he approaches the patients, like I always sit back and I'm like, man, he is so good, right? Like they're sitting here saying their pain's 10 out of 10. They just don't want to do anything. And he has somehow talked them down, talked about why they're having their symptoms. And then he gets them moving. And it's just supposed to make, you know what I mean? Just watching this. And that's my colleague, um, Dr. Jeff Bridges. So we had this idea um, because, you know, watching him do this. And I'm like, this is what our, our very chronic post-concussive syndrome patients that have been, you know, maybe provider hopping, for six months to a year who have been told the gamut of different things or they've been told not to move, right? Or not to go to school or whatever it happens to be that, you know, I had, we had this like brainchild idea of like, this is fear avoidance behavior. This is just in a different diagnosis. And we know fear avoidance behavior is very common in migrators. We know it's very common in chronic um, vestibular disorders like 3PD. And we know it's very common in chronic pain patients. And so we started having this conversation. And so I'm like, hey, like, let's throw it out there. Let's, you know, put a proposal together and see what happens. And of course it got accepted. And then we were like, oh crap, <laughs> we really need to like get this together for our presentation. And so um, we just, you know, it, it was fabulous to look at the parallels. So we presented a one hour on demand session um, that really took the fear avoidance behaviors that we see in post-concussive patients, the chronic post-concussive, I'm not talking acute, like, you know, right after injury, I'm talking the chronic um, post-concussive patients. And we did parallels to our chronic pain orthopedic patients. Mm -hmm. And then we even dug into our chronic pediatric pain patients and really pulled in and showed the parallels of how similar it was and then looking at maybe over-surveying our patients, especially when they're in that chronic state and they're seeing multiple providers and you're constantly putting in like the post-concussive symptom scale in front of their face mm -hmm. and it never changes, right? So they're getting reinforced behavior that, okay, I filled it out two weeks ago and my headache is still a six, right? Or my dizziness is still this and that and some other things. And so looking at some of the literature out of Pitt, University of Pittsburgh on over-surveying, so we pulled in the concussion clinical profile screening tool. Um, and so if you follow me on Twitter, like people have been asking for it. I've been, this is the most um, email I've gotten about like an out, like a patient reported outcome measure. So I get probably 10 emails a day from people all over. So I finally just created like, okay, here is my Google document. We actually took the 29 item questionnaire, created an Excel spreadsheet of all of the different clinical profiles and then did the calculations in Excel. So all you have to do is ask your patient, put the score in and it spits you out, right? Instead of having to go back and calculate and divide and add and all those good things. Awesome. 
Um, so it is, um, so it's huge, but we talked about using that instead of all these other ones multiple times, like until you understand what their profile is, then maybe diving deeper. So when somebody walks in your clinic and you're like, okay, you need to do the dizziness handicap inventory, the neck disability index, the hit six for your headaches. Oh, by the way, I want you to do the convergence insufficiency symptom scale, right? Like all of these and the post concussive symptom symptoms scale. Just to that. Yep. <laughs> I know, right? And so um, really using one measure across the multidisciplinary clinic um, and then really driving from there, which ones really need to be done as far as that goes. And so that work was actually done out of University of um, Pittsburgh um, and Contos et al. Um, so, but, you know, as a random find on one of my like research searches for lit review and it has changed our practice here at MU. But what is, called? It's called the Concussion Clinical Profile Screening Tool. Um, and it and we'll really put a link in the show notes for folks. Oh yeah, absolutely for that aspect. But it has really been great because now you're not over, you know, surveying them about different things that then say, oh my gosh, I'm so bad. I'm, you know, in in that aspect that they're just getting confirmation that maybe their symptoms haven't changed because maybe they haven't just gotten the right therapy or gone to the right person yet. From that I aspect, I just want to. And I just want to interject there really quick, um, but I want you to keep going is, you know, it's really for listeners tuning in is that it's really meeting the patient, the importance of meeting the patient where they are and identifying that. Um, mm -hmm. And, and really, again, you people have 30 to 60 minutes in the clinic, um, on average, you know, at best, um, if you have a 60 minute eval, that's lovely. Um, but again, you know, the frustration for both clinicians and patients who aren't um, well versed at treating uh, these concussion patients in the more chronic phase is that what they don't realize is that, hey, there, if you have like, if you're just used to doing a PCSS, a post concussive symptom scale, um, again, it's a, a gridded form. It already makes people who are visually motion sensitive and have, you know, eye mm -hmm. ocular motor tracking yep. issues already nauseous. <laughs> um, but then you just kind of do that over and over again, either. And again, you have to think of where you are as clinician in the clinic. Are you doing this over and over again because insurance is requiring of you, or you're doing it over and over again because you actually don't know? Um, what to do or how to target the treatment for your patient. And I just ask you that and let that sit with you for a second um, and just kind of get comfortable with being uncomfortable with that feeling. Because again, you're listening to Dr. Dr. Bliss here as an expert and what she's giving you is so, so valuable and important. Um, so I bring that up because we really wanna make sure that um, we can meet the patient where they are and that we have such good rapport with them that we understand, hey, if their migraines were at a six or their dizziness or balance issues were at a six, but again, they've now um, exited out of just being homebound and now they're back either shopping in a mall or they're back supermarket shopping or they're back at work and they're now a six, seven or eight. Well, we have to also meet them where they are and say, hey, you have progressed. You're, you're able to go for a mile walk yes. without having, having nausea. You're able to do X, Y, and Z. Um, you're able to exert, you're able to do all of these things that you weren't able to do because you were laying you know, in a dark room, you know, nauseous and fear avoidant. Um, so really making sure that folks that really just they hold on to this PCSS, Becky. I see it all the time when I teach. Um, and it's a, it's really good. It's good because this is this is what's going to happen. You, you know, it's part of the learning process. Um, but we have to make sure that we identify like, hey, you know, Jimmy, you may be at a six out of 10 on a symptom scale right here with, you know, your dizziness and ocular motor visual motion sensitivity. However, you just exerted yourself for 20 minutes on a treadmill <laughs> yep. in front of like a disco ball. You know, I mean, like, like let's be, um, you know, let's make sure we, again, meet the patient where they are. So anyway, I interjected it, but I just got to no, say. I think speak. it's so good because one of the questions I actually got on the chat from after watching the on-demand was like my EMR makes me have a pain, like ask them every time they come in what their pain is today. And I was like, stop doing that. Like, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So I actually, and that was one of the big points of the take home for like practical tips of working with these patients is reframing how you're talking to them. And like you said, meeting them, making it. And I say, like, I put like Jeff jokes with me. He's like, you have a picture of a cheerleader and that's all you have on this slide. I don't understand. And I was like, because it's, we're the biggest cheerleaders of these patients, right? Like we're the ones, exactly what you just said, Jess, about like, but look at what you can do. Look at how far you've come, right? Like, look at what you're able to do now. And that's actually, I don't ever say like, hey, tell me how bad your headache is today, right? Because that's going to change the, the mindset of thinking, oh, my headache's bad to tell me since the last time that you came, tell me what you can do now that you couldn't do since the last time you saw me. T 
tell me something new you've been able to do. And it's that growth mindset, right? Um, Carol Dweck, I'm a huge fan. Um, and, you know, I teach it in my classes, the whole like master adaptive learner learning theory um, framework. That's a whole other section of different things. But one of the four qualities of this, you know, master adaptive person who can continue to learn is the growth mindset. And how do we get our patients to really feel like they're not stuck in that fixed like hamster wheel, that they're not on the hamster wheel, that they're never going to be able to get off. Um, and so anyway, we kind of got and on a with, tangent, yeah, but the other things that with, we- With brain injury, that's so important <laughs> uh, because they often feel like they're in a hamster wheel because there's yeah. no clear definition of, hey, what am I going to get better? So that's a really good uh, you know, salient point that you brought up there. Yeah, and then the other thing that we um, were able to introduce, there's a FAB, Fear Avo Avoidance Behavior, TBI questionnaire. And it's six different, um, is it six? I'm trying to think, I remember. So it might be three. No, it's three different constructs specific to cognophobia. So are you afraid of doing things that are hard? Um, kinesophobia, and then just overall like activity um, you know, just anything from a stimulation. So you can actually, it's, I'm sorry, it's 16 different items, three constructs, but basically it lets you know where your patient is having a huge amount of their problem, right? Is it more cognitive? They're fearful that if they work their brain too hard, it's going to cause more damage mm -hmm. because of, you know, something they've heard, sensationalism, those types of things. So anyway, it was a great session. We got a lot of feedback. I get emails every day and then we did the Q and A. So it was like rapid fire for 30 minutes, 12 different, um, you know, questions we were able to get through. And then there was more afterwards and the ANP, so the Academy of Neuro PT did a fabulous job with the moderators because they managed the questions for us and they just re like paraphrased, right? Um, and kept us on track. So, but it was great. It was a pleasure. I think it was a conversation that really sparked more conversation, <laughs> which is the best type of conversation, right? Yes. And that's what we want in learning, right? So, <laughs> Uh, but really, how great is that, that we can have these conversations in 2021 in a COVID world right now, um, and people are still excited to learn. So really, that's that just warms my heart so much that you were able to do all of the above at CSM. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it was, a, it was, I'm very thankful and very blessed to have the opportunity just to kind of, you know, put a different spin and have us think about, you know, some of these chronic patients and how we're handling them from that aspect. Yeah, you know, as we wrap up this podcast now, and we'll we'll have a, a session two with Dr. Bliss here, um, you know, I just want to, you know, reflect on actually my own injury. I don't do it too often on the podcast, actually, Becky, but you're, you're bringing it out of me a little bit. And I think right. so from, no, it's good. Um, and, you know, I try to let you guys shine. But, you know, when I was a patient, I did 10 to 14 hours of rehab a week for 14 months. And, you know, part of my, you know, rehab was vestibular and outpatient PT, you know, orthopedics and neuro and speech and neuropsych, you kind of name it, I did it, OT, the whole thing. And the, the big thing for me is actually with my vestibular therapist. So imagine being a physical therapist, you know, I always like to joke with the Mrs. Doubtfire, I used to be one, right? Um, <laughs> you know, it's one of my favorite movies. Um, so I was in vestibular therapy and I actually had to tell my vestibular therapist and I actually see him ironically at CSM. He's in San Diego now uh, teaching. Uh, he moved from NYU, um, but I see him always at CSM. We always have a beer together. And it was something I had to ask him. I was like, you have to stop asking me how I'm feeling because I don't know. So the important mm -hmm. thing there is that I let folks know from my experience is that when you have a brain injury, subjectively, we do not have the subjective language to express the what and how we feel. So when we're, we're doing stuff to patients, you know, in rehab, um, it may take time for symptoms to, to show up. So when you're asking someone how they feel, they actually just don't have the language, no matter how smart they are to express the what and how they're feeling after brain injury. So like listening to you, you know, talk about this chronic pain and fear avoidance and the cognophobia was so important because um, from someone who had a brain injury, um, you, you really hit it on the head, you know, no pun intended. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So I, that's why I would urge therapists to really watch your patient. Is their movement degrading? Did their, you know, their face kind of change a little bit a color because their autonomic nervous system, right? They've got a mismatch, like flight or fight's hitting in, they turned a little green because you've been, you know, but really do your observation. That's what they taught us, right? Hallmark of PT, movement scientists. Mm -hmm. um, but really start to watch what your patient's doing because that's gonna give you so much more information than, okay, tell me about you know, your symptoms right now, because you should be able to start to gauge as well um, and how they you know, decompose potentially mm -hmm. as things get harder or when they're getting to the point of, okay, it's enough, it's time to back down. 
Indeed. And we'll let folks in, you know, a little bit more in on the vestibular ocular side of your specialty in, in uh, episode two of this podcast. Um, but yeah, absolutely. And, you know, for the uh, therapist that is listening in and w- where folks kind of get, I would say scared as a therapist, because it's, again, from a provocative, a provocateur standpoint, yep. um, it doesn't seem like it's that much when we're in the vestibular ocular motor world and rehab. So it can be, you know, uh, if, I hate to talk about it, but the, like the pencil push up, right? The penned cap into oh, the, into the yeah. pen. I hate to talk about it, but everyone kind of knows what that is and they can visualize that. So we'll, we'll talk about why that's a good and a bad thing. Cause um, again, everything has to be prescribed after a comprehensive targeted physical exam. I'll leave it at that for this episode. But, <laughs> um, but I say that because uh, February 3rd, 2014 was a day that at NYU is kind of still known um, to this day. So I still like see an OT, you know, if I'm in a professional conference these days, or I see my PT, you know, at, at old CSM, you know, pre-COVID. Um, but it was that day he asked me, hey, Jess, can you take, I think it was like three steps, close your eyes, open your eyes, take three steps, close your eyes, you know, and I did that three times and lengthened the hallway. I looked like a, like a sheet, like a white, like a ghost mm-hmm. um, after I was done and I was gray and I was fighting it because as adults, and this is important for clinicians tuning in, as adults, we want to be independent. We want to be able to not pee and poop our pants we, and we want to be able to drive. It really comes down to the being that simple for, for most days. Um, and when someone asks you how you're feeling, all you want to do is say fine. And you know it's the truth. If you went to college or you you know had a, too many at a wedding one time, someone falls on the floor, boom, they pop right up. They could be impaled, but they, I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. Um, and that's all adults want to be is they, they want to be fine. Um, and I say that with kick gloves, because at the end of the day, I was not fine. I was sick for hours after that simple benign task. Um, and I actually had OT after that vestibular session and within the hour. And I just remember my PT escorted me down a floor at NYU um, and walked me to into OT uh, to, my, to my occupational therapist. And it was great. She knew that I was feeling horrible and I looked horrible, apparently, um, put a weighted vest on me. And that was our session. And that's what, mm-hmm. what happened. And I went home after that in a snow storm. I'll never forget it. But to this day, we talk about February 3rd, 2014. So remembering as a physio, as a clinician, um, we may be doing very benign tasks with our patients. Um, my lesson there is never do a new thing at the end of a session. Um, so I think Brian, <laughs> Brian doesn't do that to this day. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, so I, I really connected to you as both patient and provider. And um, just thank you for all of your sharing of your knowledge and being so enthusiastic. Um, I really hope, you know, people want to keep entreeing into this world of concussion and head injury. Um, because at the end of the day, these folks really need our help. And I'm, I'm excited to record up uh, number two with you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jess. It's been fabulous. And I'll talk this all day long. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. And for the best um, ways to uh, find you, um, I know you have a new a new um, uh, project coming up, which we'll talk about in number in uh, episode number two. But how can we find you on social media and any websites that we should know about as well? Yeah, so I'm on Twitter. It just and I don't have my Twitter handle. Goodness gracious, my private tw- Twitter handle um, is I think at BlissDPT. Um, it's super yes. old, but I don't want to change it because too many people know it. Um, so that's my Twitter handle. You know, you can look me up on the University of Missouri um, DPT website. Send me an email, Rebecca.bliss at Missouri. Um, no, that's even wrong. It's Rebecca.bliss at health.missouri.edu. Um, from that aspect, um, yeah, I am always open for you know collaboration, questions, those types of stuff. I think that's really what fuels my fire is to be able to share some of my specialty and then you know serve the patient population of concussion. Um, in a different way, right? Like, hey, you know, I I never knew what this could be or, you know, those types of things of phone a friend. I like to call it phone a friend. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. Well, again, thank you for bringing your gusto, your knowledge, your expertise, um, really. And for Brain Injury Awareness Month, you know, our motto is not alone in brain injury. And I think that's also for clinicians as well. We have to be able to be comfortable to reach out to each other and and ask for help when we don't know. Um, And the most valuable thing we can do for our brain injured patients during Brain Injury Awareness Month is say to our patients, hey, I don't know, but let me take the time to find out. And Dr. Bliss is a perfect person to reach out to. So Becky, thanks so much for coming on. uh, And I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Thanks, Jess. Thank you for listening to the Concussion Corner, hosted by Dr. Jessica Schwartz. The information in this podcast is for entertainment purposes only and not to be used as personal medical advice. Don't forget to follow us on social media on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube at Concussion Corner.